Hey guys, in this series we're going to continue our exploration into how to build a game similar to Bloodborne or Dark Souls using assets from Filebase on GameDevHQ.com. And we're going to look at post-processing. What is it? How to use it? And how to get it into your game in Unity 2018.3. Hey guys, this is Al over at GameDevHQ.com and every week we bring you three amazing pieces of content related to game development. Check us out at GameDevHQ.com and be sure to like and subscribe. So this is a scene that we created inspired by a Bloodborne kind of world using assets in Filebase on GameDevHQ.com and using the basic version of Unity 2018.3 which you can download for free. In this video, we're going to show you some of the really cool tips and tricks we know on post-processing in Unity. Okay, so now we are going to dive into post-processing, and it's amazing how a little bit of post-processing brings this entire project together. And I always get really excited about post-processing because I'm from a visual effects background, so when I start seeing like ambient occlusion and I start seeing like blooms and glows and color correction, I get all excited about this stuff. So. How do we get post-processing stacks into our uh, game? Well, you go to Window, and you go to your Package Manager. And inside your Package Manager, you can look on here to see where uh, post-processing profiles are. And once you do find it, just click and install it and bring it into your, uh, bring it into your game environment. So once it's in here, it's in here. So how do we enable our post-processing stack? Real simple. We go to create, and we create a post-processing file. I'm going to call this uh, build post-processing file. I have my finished scene with my its post-processing profile, and I'm gonna use this new one right here, all right? So uh, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and create an empty game object. And in this, we're gonna call this post processing and I'm going to set my empty game object to post processing and in here if I do post processing you know I get these several choices so what I want to do is I want to choose my post processing volume and I'm going to take my post processing and apply that into my shot and then I'm going to select my main camera and select here and do post processing layer and in here I'm going to set my layer to post processing so what does this do this is now saying all right I have a post processing layer on my camera and it's set to the layer post processing this is my post processing layer because it's set to post processing and I'm going to set this to global and now my build and my effect should be here. So let's test this out immediately first. So one of the easiest ways to test this out and see if this is working is go to your color grading and go to your exposure and bring your exposure way down. And you can see that my post processing is already working. Now, if you're not seeing this, it's because you don't have this button clicked right here, which it's called, uh, what is this called? Toggle skybox fog, fog and various other effects. Post processing works and you see how uh, a slight adjustment in your post processing stack will adjust everything in here. What we wanna do is let's go ahead and start by adjusting our color information and we can select a couple different profiles here for tone mapping now I'm not seeing any major difference here um, temperature we're gonna turn this on now if we go to the right we get warm this is where like the Kelvin lights of your scene matter so what a Kelvin light is is you know when you buy a regular light bulb it has a really warm color temperature. It's got that yellowish tone. When you buy a fluorescent, it's got this kind of bluish uh, light look to it. And that's because it's got a cooler uh, color temperature. 
and you know they usually go at like 3300 kelvin or 5400 kelvin something like that um, so you can use your temperature as your color temperature of your scene to adjust how your scene looks so i'm going to go with like a slightly bluer scene and i'm going to adjust the color temperature that way so it seems a little bit cooler out here all right um, and then I can go to my post effects and this is where you know I can adjust how bright or how dark my scene is uh, for my environment uh, without actually adjusting the lights in the scene which is kind of a, a cool little thing to do and then another thing I'd like to do is adjust my contrast so you know if I go this way and I decontrast it I start to get a little bit more of like a like an overall fog effect in the scene or if I do a stronger contrast like this you know and I'd probably have to bump up my um, exposure to even make it visible you can see how now everything is really vibrant and stuff like that but mm, we're not really looking for that in this scene we actually want to go a little bit the other direction we kind of want to desaturate uh, decontrast it um, saturation, of course, is the amount of color you have in your scene. So you could take it to black and white, or you can go, you know, amazing Technicolor. We don't need saturation, though. Now, I'm going to use my color wheels down here. <clears throat> so I'm going to go ahead and turn these on. And these color wheels were actually created, uh, they call them trackballs, um, I guess way back in the post days. Uh, they'd actually have these, like, mouse trackballs that they used. Was, there was a guy whose job was to adjust the lift, the gamma, and the gain, and he had, like, these mouse trackballs that he would adjust in real time, and it would adjust the colors on the the, the television, and it was, it was quite fantastic. Um, but, you know, uh, we got mouses now, so we don't need to worry about that. Um, so what I've always kind of just taken as a rule is you never want to go one color all in the same direction because then it gets crazy what you want to do is you want to kind of take your colors and pull them in slightly opposite directions and when you do that you start adding in really interesting color information into your scene and you start diving into that uh Michael Bayish world of of color uh, theory. Um, I'm sure there's lots of areas, especially if you guys study some film, where they will go into far higher uh, in from, uh, detail in how to, to do fantastic color wheel theories. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to cover that here because I am just not qualified to give that to you guys. Um, <clears throat> But that's some of the stuff I'd like to do uh, with the color uh, grading, just to get started. Then, what I also want to do is jump into ambient occlusion. I'm going to turn that on. What ambient occlusion? What is this? I hear this all the time. I have no idea what it is. When you get geometry that normal faces start getting close to each other like this um, it creates a false shadow and that's what ambient occlusion is it has to have geometry that's close to it and you add that in well, you can see what happens no ambient occlusion ambient occlusion none full ambient occlusion you see how your scene just automatically like boom comes to life it's like the shadows in the scene all of a sudden become relevant really cool and easy way to to fill in the dark patches now if you're doing a more realistic render generally they they frown upon using ambient occlusion because people can tend to see that but since we're doing video games yeah, go go crazy have fun with it um there's a couple other variants in here i really don't mess with these uh usually i just get in enough to to create kind of a false shadow then i like to go into <clears throat> bloom Bloom is a favorite of mine. Um, so what does Bloom do? Well, Bloom makes your highlights get really bright. And I want to look at making sure that this gas has an emission channel to it. As long as it has an emission channel, it's going to treat that color like it is a, uh, 
like it's a light source. So I'm gonna turn on my intensity and I'm just gonna slightly drag it up to maybe three. Now here's where you get it. You get the thresholds and you see where if you start pulling down on the thresholds, it changes what is considered illuminated. So I can go into my scene and I can take areas that, you know, if I go too far, everything becomes illuminated, but I could just grab enough of the areas that are, and I'll, let me switch to my game view, main camera, switch to there. You can kind of see now my lights are glowing in the scene, but everything else isn't, which is kind of where I want it to be. You know, I want this scene to be dark, but I want the lights to still give off a sense of illumination. Really cool trick right there. There's a couple other things like soft knee and da da da. That's all right. Uh, fast mode is something you should turn on though. And fast mode makes it so that when you are rotating your camera, you don't get these huge flickers in your um, your light sources, which can be really distracting. Um, another thing, which is a really cool tool to use, is this dirtiness. I love this dirtiness thing. Now, what is it? You turn on and you need to create a texture. And the texture, the dirtiness is, imagine you got, um, you're outside in the rain and you're, you're looking through a camera and there's some raindrops on your lens. And so you don't actually see the raindrops, but you see the refraction of light in your raindrops. So I love using this. Um, go ahead and grab this and then in the HD or the file base 2D, let's see, dirty lens. I like to just drop in one of these kind of textures that looks kind of like this. You can find these online, they're sitting around everywhere. Um, let me create a couple custom ones just for us. And then you drop that into here and then you change the intensity. And now you increase the intensity of your dirtiness and you see how my lens is starting to get that 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 reflection on here that's so cool that that's exactly where you and as we move our camera around you see how the 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 lens is adjusting with the new water parts in your lens uh the the water reflect refraction that's where it's at right there that's cool as you move in closer, you can see it. Ah, beautiful, beautiful stuff. All right, then we go to add effects, and let's see, uh, da, 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 da. grain. I always like to add a little bit of grain to everything. Um, I don't want it colored. I want some intensity though, but very subtle. You know, we're, we're, we're... this is too much. This is Silent Hill crazy, uh, which is not bad. I like Silent Hill, but that's too much. But something subtle, you know, point two is good. And then <clears throat> I think the final thing I like adding in post effect is I don't want lens distortion. I don't want motion blur. Yeah, lens distortion is kind of like your 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 lens isn't perfect. Like a 50 millimeter lens is like what you see with your eyes. But when you get wider, like a 28 millimeter or um, something in that range, an 18 millimeter lens, you get this like fisheye distortion. That's what that's all about. Motion blur I don't care about right now. Speed space, screen space reflections, I have no real reflective surfaces in here, um, so that's okay. Uh, I'm, ne I'm not reflecting it off the ground. Uh, my, my ground is actually very uh, uh, op opaque and, and non-reflective, so I'm just going to go down here to my vignette, and the vignette, of course, is a distortion from your actual camera lens. So sometimes you have a camera lens and it, of course it's always circular, right? Um, but what a vignette is, especially with older lenses or cheaper lenses, is you actually start to, as you pull out and go as wide as possible, you start capturing some of the uh, lens in your shot. You'll see this in older cameras where you'll watch it and you'll, you'll have this like gradient that occurs around it. And, and you could see it kind of here as I add it in. You see this like circular? Imagine this is your actual camera lens that you're looking through. And, and this is the opening and this is the outside exterior. That's what vignetting is. But, you know, it's, it's usually a flaw, but we've gotten to the point where we're so used to it that if we don't have it, it looks weird. And so, you know, we knew, use it now as almost a way to draw attention away. So look at this shot right here. 
you see everything, right? If I pull this in, just a slight vignette, now what's your focus? Right here in the center of my scene. Can you still see everything? Absolutely. But your focus is now pulled into the center. So that's the purpose behind the vignetting right there. Um, so just something subtle like this. Here's the crazy part about post-processing. You click this, let me turn this off. That's what it looked like, non-post-process. On, off, on, off, on. Crazy amount of information can be added into your scene using the post-processing stack. Absolutely love it. <clears throat> now we clicked on this global because we wanted this post-processing to be global, but you can actually set it to where uh, these post-processing volumes can be kind of like fall-offs in boxes. And as you walk into each one, uh, the entire environment changes and adapts to it. So uh, a good example, think of Sky, uh, not Skyrim, uh, 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 <laughs> Elder Scrolls Oblivion. You know, you're, you're walking up toward the Oblivion gates and all of a sudden it turns like super red and crazy and, and it looks like you're, you're in a hell portal. That's how you can do those hell portals is using this post-processing volume. Really, really cool effect. So, you know, just by doing these adjustments, now here is our graveyard scene. Oh, this is spooky and intimidating and I absolutely love it. So that's it for this tutorial. Uh, next week, we're going to dive into the final parts of this. We're gonna do our final little bits, clean it up, and you should have a scene that you could start using for your, um, uh, your, your new Dark Souls or Bloodborne builds. So I hope you enjoyed it and I'll catch you later. And a special thanks to all the Plus and Pro members out there. Your support keeps this thing going and we greatly appreciate it. We also love committing to New Year's resolutions. and Some of you are falling off. So to recommit, I would suggest pressing that button. Not this one, the dislike, no. That one, the like button and the subscribe button. Maybe I got to flip this video around just to make sure. This is Al. I'm out of here. Have a good one. Take care. into your game into you in fact i know you want to stick in with us like a new year's as you stop special thanks to all the plus and pro members out there your stop these two buttons like ignore the dislike just press the like button <laughs> don't don't give up keep going keep going. just press the buttons Crystal buttons. Every week we bring you three amazing pieces of content. I look like I have permanent bitch face. <sighs>